Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Showalter, Budget Director Mingi, and uh, our state economist, uh, Dr. Klamakitas, to to help all of us uh, take a look at this 30,000 foot snapshot of where Minnesota's economy and budget stands as of today. Um, and that's a good spot where we're at. These were decisions that were made uh, looking towards the future and looking for the best interest of Minnesotans. And the Lieutenant Governor and I, since we've had the privilege of doing this job, even before that when we were running, we talked about making sure that Minnesota's a state where every child and every family can thrive that our tax system's fair, that we invest in the things that give people opportunity while reducing costs for middle class folks, working people, and seniors. Uh, this budget numbers that you see, this forecast, um, gives us a little better view of what the future looks like. Uh, it is, again, I would remind everyone, a 30,000 foot view. And while this is a positive budget report today, it doesn't tell the whole story, and it doesn't tell the story of a parent who is having trouble finding and paying for childcare right now and are struggling with that. It doesn't tell the story of families that are still struggling with gas prices while they've come down are still high and food prices are still high. It doesn't tell the story about our commuters that are dependent on transit and good roads and bridges across this state to get them to their jobs and move their products if they're business owner. And it doesn't tell the story about how we need to get the resources into our schools so that eighth grader who needs to catch up on some geometry before ending high school needs to get done. So the macro picture is solid. The golden opportunity that we have to make Minnesota an even better and fair and more inclusive and more prosperous state is there, and the opportunity to work together in the legislative bodies to make that happen um, is there. We have uh, made no doubt, uh, made it very clear, I think, Lieutenant Governor and myself, that we believe the things that we can do are investing in education and in our classrooms, making sure that all of the services are there, whether it's making sure every child has a meal when they come through that door, or making sure we have all the services from mental health services to the support staff in those schools, making sure our teachers have the resources to deliver and our students and their families have the capacity to make sure Minnesota schools stay the best in the country. At the same time, we start thinking about how do we close those gaps with research that's out there, making sure we have teachers that look like the students in their class. Classrooms. We have the opportunity to make sure that we're using the federal infrastructure dollars to continue to modernize Minnesota's infrastructure, thinking towards the future, making sure our roads, our bridges, our transit systems are there, but also looking toward what does it mean to electrify our transportation grid and having those charging stations and capacity across the state so we can deal with climate change in a real practical manner by also creating jobs. And it means that we reduce some of those costs to folks, that we have the opportunity, as we've talked about, get money back in the hands of people, get some of this back in the form of rebates to people to be able to use as they see fit. And we think that we may continue to strive to make sure Minnesota's tax system remains fair. And we had the opportunity, as we've talked about, and we proposed in 2019 around the Social Security tax repeal for a large number of Minnesotans to make sure that's easier for them. We can do all of these things. This isn't a choice of either or. It's smart budgeting and invests in Minnesota's people invest in an economy that understands where the future is going, understands that demographic changes are making it more difficult in the workforce, but ways that we can attract people back in. These are common universal themes that we heard while we were out campaigning. Make things a little easier for us. Make things a little fairer. Make sure we have the opportunity to do what we want to do. Invest in communities. I was with the counties yesterday. Um, proposals around public safety that are holistic ways that we can make sure that we're, we're preventing crimes in the front end or if we're dealing with them in real time or what happens as rehabilitative and restorative justice programs are put into play. Those are things that our local elected and local entities are hungry for. It's the innovation that happens in those areas that the state now has the capacity to be even a better partner. But I want to be very clear. We're setting on, as you just heard Mary talking about, some historic record numbers, from historic record unemployment to surpluses. And I'll remind Minnesotans, during the term of the Walls Flanagan administration, we have not raised taxes, we lowered them. Different buying patterns, different things that have happened, corporate profits have raised this. We've also seen some things that have affected um, state spending to go down. And I think when Minnesotans are saying we need to align revenues with spending, to have the best impact that we can measure and get results for Minnesotans, that's exactly the way I think all of us are looking at this. That's exactly what we should be doing. And this gives us a 
historic opportunity to maybe realign some of those things. But keeping in mind, a state like Minnesota with a diverse economy, the fifth most diverse, with historic low unemployment rates, with historically high labor participation rates compared to the rest of the country, with innovation in job growth, with moving to address things like climate change and inequities uh, inside our systems, all of those things positions us as well as any other state for us to be an attractive place to say, this is where I want to raise my family. This is a place I want to start my business. This is the place where I know my family can achieve what they want to achieve. So I want to give a big thank you to Minnesota's workers who have endured some of the most uh, turbulent times that we've seen. It's certainly in a generation, maybe potentially in our state's history. And not only did they endure it, they came out innovatively. Our business owners, the same thing. Our students, our teachers. And I'd like to add too, and it looks like we're in a good space to be able to talk about this, our nurses and our healthcare systems that reached a compromise to continue to deliver world-class healthcare to every single one of our Minnesotans. So I'm gonna single out a couple people that Lieutenant Governor and I had the privilege over the last few weeks and we were out on the campaign trail. There's a young woman named Chow Trong in Northfield. She's a full-time college student. During the pandemic, she also started her own business and is hiring and uh, building her community in Northfield. Those are the decisions that were made and the type of visions that was made that added to this budget surplus and the outlook for Minnesota's economy looking so bright. Um, our Helene up in the Iron Range, the number one producer of solar panels in North America. Minnesota is going to be a leader in addressing climate change and the creation of green jobs, and that is going to bring more economic prosperity. And instead of trying to figure out how to cut the pie even further, we expand the pie to reduce the cost on individuals and open up opportunities. We are well positioned to do that. Or an entrepreneur like Shawnee Grigsby, who started Flava Coffee in St. Paul, not only seeing that as an economic opportunity, but a bridge to bridge some of the inequities that we have and bring cultural differences to the forefront so that we can address those and make sure that Minnesota, when we talk about a place to be successful, every single Minnesotan sees and hears that meant to them, that they are not excluded. So I'm excited about this. Now's the time to lower costs for families. Now's the time to reduce and get some money back in their pockets. Now's the time to make sure that those classrooms are funded with the things that they need to do um, to make our kids the best qualified workforce in the world and the best opportunity for individuals to thrive. So uh, Lieutenant Governor and I are excited about this. We're excited about the work that will happen now. On January 24th, we will be releasing the budget numbers that will be reflected by this uh, forecast, and more importantly, be reflected by the conversations and the hard work we're doing with Minnesotans in all of these different areas of ways that we can make a difference. And then, of course, we will do it in partnership with our legislative partners. You're going to hear in just a little bit here from uh, incoming Majority Leader Dietzik from Minnesota Senate, and you're going to hear from Leader Long and Whip Hollins um, on what the legislative priorities are over there. We are independent branches. We share many of the same values, but we need to work together to make sure Minnesotans are reflected. And that includes working with the minorities in the House and Senate to make sure that all Minnesotans feel that they're a part of this. There's golden opportunities for us to do things on so many fronts, also including a bonding bill which will have projects like the Dilworth Fire Hall in it. We walked away from a deal that would have made a difference in Minnesotans' lives in May. I hope the lesson that we all take from that is, when we reach a compromise deal that improves Minnesotans' life, my pro tip of the day is take it. Take it and do what's right for Minnesota and good politics will follow that. Today, our administration, along with our partners in the House and Senate, make that commitment that we need to make sure government works for people, make sure it makes their life easier, make sure it keeps public safety as a forefront, public education at the heart, making sure the tax system is fair and reduce costs on their family, and making sure we look to the future and understand that when we do budgets, we need to talk about inflation not when it's 8.1%, but when it's year in and year out at 2%, to do budgets without talking about inflation is simply disingenuous. I stood in front of you clear back in 2018 before we were uh, even inaugurated or sworn in when we did our first November budget forecast, and we talked about the need to start addressing honestly around inflationary costs in state budgets, and I hope that's a topic that we can bring up. And I would close before I get some, um, 
some questions from all of you. The continuing strive to make sure that we are as efficient as we can possibly be, make sure that we're not just, we're good stewards of taxpayer dollars, but we use new ways to find better and more innovative ways to deliver services more collaboratively. And I've said this for the last three years, the one silver lining that came out of COVID was it forced state government to break down some of our silos to re-envision how we can work better together and doing that with our private sector partners and our nonprofit partners. That gives Minnesota a well position. We're not looking at um, having to reinvent the wheel, but we should be looking to make a more efficient wheel. We should be looking at ways that we can make that wheel work better for the folks who are out there and think about what is that future horizon going to look like and use this budget time. I'd like to think that at some point in time, some of these positive changes we can make that we used this budget surplus and this budgetary environment and the post COVID changes to create a more inclusive, a healthier, a more uh, nimble, Minnesota economy and state government. With that, Lieutenant Governor will take some questions. <laughs> Governor, what about inflation? Inflation is real in the economy. You said it it. it's not in the forecast, though. Past lawmakers, past governors have had inflation. Is it time for that to return to the budget forecasting process? Yeah, and I, I brought this up. And again, this is going to be working with our partners. I, I've always said I make it sense. And trust me, I'm not naive in this. It's hard to do. But I don't think we can pass surpluses because it, it, it frustrating to the public too. It's frustrating the folks who see this. Well, we gave a a 1.9% increase to education. Well, if real inflation that year was 2.1%, there wasn't seeing an increase. And the public is going, why do they keep asking for money? So I think we're taking very seriously in the buying power. It's when we talk about things like uh, local government sales tax issues for projects they're doing. When we remove those, that's a real impact for some of those folks. Because if we're thinking right now, projects that are out there, we were screaming on bonding bills, let's bond why we can get great rates or whatever. The rates aren't as great now, but the projects are still going to go up in cost. So my commitment on this, and I think the conversation I want us to start having is, we need to budget and budget forecast with inflation as a part of it. And, and again, you saw the, the forecasts on this. I think it's probably, if history's any indication of this, we'll start to go back to those more traditional, stable 2% unemployment rates You know, over the next 18 months or so, um, but those are always going to be there. That's just the nature of things. I think we need to forecast for it, and I think we need to have the conversation on budgeting for it. That is not government on autopilot. That is just honest budgeting. So I hope that conversation can happen. Governor, I don't want to raise a sore subject, but you had a deal. That, of course you do. The, you know that. <laughs> the, you had the 444 yes. uh, agreement, and, and that just sort of was a framing where you had one-third, one-third, one-third. Yep. Do you have any similar ratios in your brain as you start to produce your budget for, no, for using good, this it surplus? is a good question um and i think what that did was is it, it left the, the uncertainty and remember you heard uh commissioner showalter talk about this we are at historic levels in addition to this on the uh the rainy day funds we left the four billion with the idea that there would be a new incoming um, group of legislators and they could have a piece of that i think though with that idea of you know, a portion of this thinking about the future a little more cautious, a portion of it going into reduction of costs for people, either in the form of rebate checks, which we've uh, advocated for, in addition to, I think, Social Security uh, tax cuts, uh, those types of things, and then the piece on the spending. I think the biggest thing I've said, and I hope I don't get misconstrued on this, I think it makes sense to look at the one-term funding where we can do that, focus on the programs that are there, but I also want to be very clear. When I say that, I'm not talking about not funding things into the future that grow the economy. If we don't figure out ways to close some of the gaps in education, we're not going to see budget surpluses in the future. If we don't build our infrastructure out, we're not going to see those. If we don't address climate change, we're going to see a negative impact on our economy that is going to lower these things and we don't have the ability to do any of that. So I think it makes sense maybe us to view it on um, what is going to be in terms of short-term one-time spending versus some of the long-term commitments and how do we make sure that when we're talking about some of those reductions in costs, and I just want to be very clear, I am going to advocate for some reductions, especially around the Social Security tax. Um, I think you're going to see us continue to advocate whether and the, they'll do their work in the legislature around um, some of these rebate checks, but I'm focusing on working class Minnesotans and senior citizens. I think the only thing I can pledge you for certain around taxes is I will not be proposing a tax cut for the wealthiest Minnesotans. That's not gonna happen. Um, with that being said, there's a lot of ideas open to be able to deal with. Tom? Go uh, Governor, uh, I hear you say you're not gonna cut 
taxes for the wealthiest, are there other tax cuts you would consider? And then secondly, a lot of people concerned about local property taxes. Yes. We're seeing those rates go up in some place, in cases exorbitantly. Will there be more money for local government yes. aid and that type of thing? Yes, good question. Again, Social Security tax. And again, what I proposed is, and we, we'll have this conversation amongst the legislators or whatever, um, we proposed in 2019 cuts to the Social Security tax by raising that limit. I think we have about 55% of Social Security recipients pay no state tax in Minnesota. If we take that ceiling up further, I simply said, I don't know if if the richest Minnesotans, billionaires, need a tax cut on Social Security, but we can have that conversation. The local property tax issue, again, that is a result on when you're seeing these levy increases, that is a direct result of us not doing the deal in May. That means schools were waiting for the money to go, local government aid, county program aid, and those things. And I am going to advocate again in our budget that we increase local government aid, we do the county program aid. It's an effective way. Counties especially are delivering a lot around the human services. If we're addressing the infrastructure needs using the federal money of the bipartisan infrastructure bill and we're making sure we're getting money out in the form of public safety whether that be grants to community programs or for more policing um, all of those things reduce costs on local governments of necessities that they have to deliver and I've said this time and time again folks who come to St. Paul and vote against any type of investments and then crow about their fiscally conservative need to go back and stand in front of their county commissioners and their city councils who have to plow the roads, who have to educate the children, who have to deliver services. And I think that's why you're seeing that. So I would make the case to all of those entities out there, this is a golden opportunity to reduce property tax. And it goes back to what we've been talking about. That is a direct impact of savings to middle-class families that will have more money in their pocket to weather some of these inflationary costs. Sort of follow up. It sounds like you're backing off a little bit from a total elimination of the Social Security income tax, especially for the wealthiest, and then also any other taxes you would consider for well, we'll get into that. We'll, when we see what's out there, child tax credits, there's some of those things that I know are going to be proposed. Again, if it's impacting positively middle class working people and seniors, I'm for it. And just to be clear, I'm making that case on the full elimination of the Social Security tax. Because again, as you see this, as we get higher and higher in retirement income that people get, the impact of that Social Security tax what, is, is almost unnoticeable to the folks making that much, but it's part of the revenue stream that goes back into delivering for seniors. But, but I said it and I agreed to it in, in May that I was open to, to, uh, to talk about that. That deal was not taken by Senate Republicans, so now we're gonna have to renegotiate on it. I am open to renegotiating with them on it. Governor, you, you, uh, you mentioned a couple times uh, rebate checks. How big, how soon, and have you had conversations with your legislative leaders, the incoming leaders, about perhaps front-loading that? We have a, a little bit. We proposed $1,000 per person, $2,000 per family. I was open to that. I think there's, we, we have discussed this. Um, it's no secret that it was uh, received lukewarmly, I think, over... Uh, by both chambers and, and probably bipartisanly, but I still go back to this. If you want to reduce some of the costs in, for the short run and make an impact on families, especially those who really need it, um, it's one of the most effective ways. So uh, we're going to propose it again. Uh, we are willing to work to see about maybe what some of those income limits were, if they wanted to see those change. Um, but I think for most Minnesotans out there, and I, I, I always look at this and I, I tell my staff when I'm doing this, if my wife and I are teaching in Mankato, how would we hear this? And what we would want to see is there's a budget surplus. We would try and understand why that was. And then I think we would say is, well, they're going to fund education and they're going to try and reduce costs. They're going to do some infrastructure. Those are all things that we would obviously support. But I would think that there's two teachers sitting out there saying, you've got this budget surplus. Return some of it back to us in some way. Make sure that it's getting back to us. So I'm open to hearing where that's at. We know that there are many ways you can reduce costs. I want to be clear. We... Uh, had a great conversation last week. One of the days, ways you can reduce costs for working families while increasing labor participation rates is get child care under control and fund those and make sure that child care is accessible and affordable to all families. That's a major way to put money back. So I think when we talk about these things, there's going to be the universal deal that we come to. But I am still going to advocate for direct checks sent back to people. I think the starting point would be that $1,000, $2,000 for family um, to make a difference. I had a couple more. Go ahead. Eric. Governor, could you uh, quantify what uh, fully funding E-12 means, and do you have a number in mind? Yeah, we will come with that when the legislature meets, but I think it's the biggest thing when we talk to people about this. When I myself talk about fully funding, both as an educator and the parent of a 
uh, a sophomore in, in Minnesota public schools. It's making sure that that student has the resources they need to be able to do what they need to get done and, and achieve their education. So first of all, starting out, I think we're gonna talk about that. We think we need to see universal meals so this, this food insecurity issue is taking away. We know that we need to increase the number of mental health counselors that are there. Minnesota continues to rank near the bottom and it's unacceptable. And then making sure those classroom teachers have what they need and it's a diversified workforce. I think once the budget process starts to go, and I mean, think about this, this is such a new day for Lieutenant Governor and I, this is a true story. When I put my budget out and I went over and to talk to the legislatures and those that were uh, in charge of the education, they weren't even going to hold a hearing. And as it turned out, they gave us five minutes. They gave us five minutes to present our education budget on what we would try and do. This year, I think, is going to be a different story where we can have experts that come in there, inform us on what that looks like, talk about what's effective, put in things that we can quantifiably measure what we're getting out of those investments and come up with a number. So I, uh, I, we will put a number on it by January 24th, but I would just say I've worked in a legislative body where the committee process worked and it is amazing what they're able to come up with. We don't claim to have all the answers. I think our legislative partners working together that we will start to get that. Governor, time for a couple more? Governor, in your... Yeah, go ahead. Governor, um, since you have a very close legislative majority in the Senate, what is their need for a bonding bill? Why don't you just do a direct spending bill on that question? Because as I said, I went to uh, the counties yesterday. All the counties were there, all 87 tables. And I walked in, and I got a standing ovation from 11 tables. So um, you know how this works. Actually, they're all there. And I said, you know what? And they, they mentioned, as all of you have, you talk about one Minnesota, but you didn't win as many counties as you did before. And I said, what it means on that is, is that those counties, especially in greater Minnesota, are going to get exactly what they deserve. Good roads, good schools, aid to do the things that they need to do. So I think the reason that you try and go at a bonding bill on this is, is because I care deeply what minority members in the House and Senate need for this. Whoever represents Dilworth has an argument that I've agreed with and will in all of these areas that these are projects that are worthy of being funded. And I think if you go just to straight cash on this, that you may leave out some of those projects. So just as a follow up, you can do the same thing with a direct spending bill and you can get all of what you've just said accomplished, yeah. but you only need a simple majority to pass the bill as opposed to having a super majority of six. Yeah. Votes. And I'm going to make the case, you know, and I, I've heard somebody say this. They say, you know what you call a one vote majority, a majority. But I'm going to take this a little bit further to not be facetious about this, that I care about what those members have. I've been in the minority on these things. I've been in a situation when we had divided government. If there is a true desire to work bipartisanly, I think it serves Minnesota so much better that we do that in the traditional way. I would like to get the number of votes it takes to pass a bonding bill with Republican support to do that. Um, I, I think that's the place where we need to start. Obviously, there's leverage to say we don't need to do that, but I think there's a large number of Minnesotans would feel like they're not being heard, that they're not being included. And I am a champion of that bonding bill. I am as committed as I was back in 2017 when Peggy and I started running that we need to unify the state and quit dividing this, quit saying that we're not getting this, we're not going to invest in this, because I'm going to be clear in that bonding bill, there is going to be money for Lake Street that was held up. There is going to be money for Minneapolis that after we had civil unrest and families and businesses that were uh, displaced. And those are things that benefit greater Minnesota the same way. So we'll bring it back. I think Go we have time for one yeah, more. Yeah, Governor. Uh, uh, Governor, I was just was wondering if you, um, given the size of this surplus, uh, do you feel that, can you characterize Minnesota's tax rates as too high? Are we collecting too much revenue because these surpluses are so high? Well, that's a fair question. I think listening to uh, Dr. Klamakitis, is this a, is this an anomaly, a one time, was this spending differences and federal infusion of money um, that caused some of this? I think we're always looking at ways that we can make sure the system is fair. I think most Minnesotans are willing to pay taxes if they feel like what they're getting for it makes sense, um, if they're getting a return on their dollar that makes sense. And I think this gives us a time to pause and reconfigure a little bit. That's why I'm very much open on this issue of Social Security tax. I think there's some child tax credits that we need to look at. And, um, and we've agreed before to tax cuts. We even agreed, uh, in I believe, in the, the 2019 budget um, to some more broader uh, cuts that are in there. But I want to hear those conversations. Um, I want to understand what the long-term effect of that is. I don't want to set up an imbalance or create a cliff. Um, 
in long-term budgeting, but I think it's a fair point to say, does this prove that there's an opportunity for us to get the amount of services to recalibrate what we can get for that and to provide some relief? And, and again, I think the answer to that is that yes, we will wanna look at that, but I'm gonna make sure that I narrow those parameters. It's going to be targeted at working folks and senior citizens um, in that middle bracket. We're, we're not gonna have a conversation on, on the top tier because it's not what Minnesotans told us on the campaign trail and we're coming out of this. These were competing ideas. These were competing ideas that were put in front of Minnesotans and they chose to go with us on this. So I think when we go into a legislative session, um, I'm keeping that in mind. Final Go thoughts? Uh, yeah, Governor, um, right over here to your left. Uh, in your first two budgets, you proposed some tax increases in some areas, uh, top tier, corporate tax, gas tax. Uh, are you going to take a tax increase off the table in this next budget? No, the same thing I said when, when we first went in, I think until we look at the whole budget, I think it's disingenuous to go into this by closing doors. The only door I closed on this is I'm not gonna give a cut at those top levels, that, that's not gonna happen. Um, but I do think we need to look at and have a conversation when we're looking, are there areas where tax decreases and balancing make sense? But as we think about things, and I'm just gonna you know, thank goodness the federal government did what they hadn't done in over 40 years. They passed an infrastructure bill. I do think we need to put Minnesota on a path to think about some of these long-term funding needs around either transportation, whether it's um, transit or roads and bridges, to understand long-term what that looks like. So we're not proposing that at this time, but I also think it'd be disingenuous to take it off the table because we have a responsibility to put us in a long-term stable place. So. But Governor, if you want to pass paid leave, um, isn't that already saying that there's probably going to be a tax increase? I know previous proposals, it was like a over $1 billion program that would have been a, a bump to, to yeah, businesses. Yeah, there were different mechanisms on how to do that. I do think, and we are certainly supportive as an administration of a paid family leave program, especially for our smaller employers and for all Minnesotans to be able to participate in that. We think those are the types of things that... Um, that grow the economy, that make Minnesota more appealing to folks. And that's why I wanna be clear that um, we're not saying no, but I think once again, the benefit from that, and I think most Minnesotans uh, certainly agreed with us on this, that a proposal to have a paid family leave program is very, very appealing and in the long run, saves families money, doesn't make them choose between being with a newborn and, um, and being at work, they can do both. Anybody else, we have final ones? Governor, can I follow up quickly on that? Because sure, you sure, talked we'll about here. things that make Minnesota more appealing. You heard the question earlier, not only do we have record surpluses, but record unemployment. We need people to come to yeah. this state to sustain the workforce. What do you see as what you're able to do to get more people to move here and work here? Yeah, well, I'm making the case, if you're a teacher in Florida, teach here, um, we allow you to teach. Um, you're not gonna hear mandates coming from the governor's office around your teaching. You're going to be able to do what our communities need you to do. I think it's making sure again that, that uh, housing is affordable. I think we have to have a conversation as we've said around public safety and, and understand what that looks like in the long run. I think things like paid family leave and access to childcare, um, protecting our natural resources and the ability for people to be able to enjoy those things and continuing to make a diverse economy no matter where you come from, religion, race, um, ethnic background, that you feel welcome and safe in Minnesota. Um, and that's something that we've always done pretty well. We need to continue to do so. And again, we're not talking, I see these other states advertise and, and poach. We need to make sure that our business clim climate is conducive to folks wanting to do that. We're still seeing good business growth. It can't be the simplification, but tax policy is a part of that. And so I think having that conversation of looking, and again, the, the Minnesota adage of skate where the puck is going to be, everybody's kind of in this same boat. We're just further along in it and have a little more diversified economy. But one of the things we learned when our trade missions, which have proven pretty fruitful though, countries like Japan and Finland that mirror Minnesota in a lot of ways, a little more of an aging population, a fairly high um, outcomes around social issues like healthcare access and education levels and things like that, but a real dilemma on how to create more 
workforce for a time when that's becoming harder and the costs are a little bit more. So I think we're trying to learn from our partners both here in other states but also globally ways we can make ourselves uh, appealing. And I can tell you in those trades, for example, in Finland, the Finnish leadership all the way up to the president was very clear. We're not going to be investing in states that aren't taking climate change and equity seriously. So as they're starting to look to states, and I think a lot of folks and companies are going to have to start to see this, if, if we're seeing state governments, you know, run wars on, you know, corporations over ideological differences, rather than creating a safe space where everybody's welcome here, Minnesota can do that well. And, and we're seeing that, that, that women's rights and women's choices on their own reproductive rights are going to be protected in Minnesota now. So as companies and businesses and families are thinking about relocating, those are things we can do. And then I think always staying uh, welcoming to our immigrant um, and refugee community has been a big part of Minnesota's success story. Need to continue to focus to make sure that we do that right. So we had one more in the back. So, yeah, Governor, you said at one point we can. You said that you, uh, at one point, you believe you can do it all in terms of relief, um, whether it's rebates, yeah. taxes, spending, whether or not that happens, we'll see in the months to come. But today, what would you say to Minnesotans who might be looking at property tax increases, who might be looking at those bills come and do right now? What can you say to them today on what they can count on yeah. later this year? Yeah, I think they should have an expectation that we deliver immediate relief to them and then long-term reduction in cost to middle-class folks. Um, again, I'll go back to talking to the counties. Um, these are folks that have to they have to make the buses run on time. They have to fund the schools. And when we froze and didn't move that $9 billion, their budget still came forward to them. And so I think, and this is what I'm talking, and you're going to hear in just a moment from the legislators, and I think there's a shared commitment in this. Um, get your work done on time. Be very clear and transparent. Have the hearings that are out there and have the administration over there to defend some of the things that are happening. Um, continue to improve. but. I think it's a combination, and I, I think the model going back to it was we had a good mix of reductions in cost to folks, investments in things that grow the economy, improves people's lives, all while being fiscally responsible in the long run. So if I were a Minnesota, someone sitting out there looking at what this is, my expectations are they're going to see a reduction in some of the cost to them, some improvements in things that they've asked for, whether it's paid family leave or, or health care um, access, some of those things, at the same time being good partners with local government to reduce some of those. Because this was my concern, and, and I, you know, each individual entity of those, those governmental bodies is a little bit different, but I think it's safe to say that the inaction that we had here at, in St. Paul forced local governments to have to make decisions around property tax, that it's not too late for us to get that work done and provide them the relief. So I think there should be some relatively high expectations that this is an effective legislative session that addresses the issues most uh, important to them, but also has a vision around addressing the big issues like climate change and healthcare access and those types of things. We can do that. And when I say we can do it all, we may not get everything we want, but there is certainly the capacity here to provide all of those things. And, and if it's about improving the lives of Minnesotans and putting our state in a better place to compete both nationally and globally, this is a legislative session to do it. Um, I know that that's not going to be without its challenges, and I know that the folks coming up next are an independent branch of governance that will work the will of their folks who all hold an election certificate, and we will work to find some compromise. So I'm grateful you're all here. I'm glad now I think we're going to turn it over to uh, incoming Majority Leader Dietzik. Um, Majority Leader Long and Whip Hollins are going to take some questions. Ready? Let's go. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, the Vikings are 10 and 2. Look at that. <laughs> Pretty good day and no strike. So good work. Hi, everybody. I'm incoming Majority Leader, Senate Majority Leader, Kerry Dietzik. As Commissioner Showalter and Governor Wall stated, our projected $12 billion surplus is expected to grow to $17.6 billion. 
That puts Minnesota in an incredibly strong position to help Minnesotans in the upcoming legislative session. We listened to Minnesotans during the campaign. They told us they were tired of gridlock and inaction. Families and communities have real needs and they want action. My caucus was very disappointed when people walked away from signed agreements at the end of last session. So starting in January, with this legislative trifecta, we will use this tremendous opportunity to help Minnesotans afford their lives. We won't walk away. We were elected to lead and we will get things done. That means doing the hard work, defining agreement where it exists, and producing a bold, balanced budget that will keep our economy strong, help families and workers, and keep Minnesota as a national leader in so many areas. We're here to lead. We plan to be creative and strategic and look at a number of issues to help working Minnesotans afford their lives, keep our families safe and our schools strong, and take action to help the climate. With this projected surplus, the Senate DFL is ready to get to work in January on behalf of Minnesotans. We're ready to tackle the challenges facing kids, families, workers, seniors, and our communities so all Minnesotans can succeed. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am uh, incoming Majority Leader Jamie Long, and I'm joined here by incoming Majority Whip Athena Hollins. And uh, we just came off the campaign trail, and we heard loud and clear from Minnesotans their concerns for their families, for their neighbors, and their communities. Minnesotans want a state that works better for everyone. They want a legislature that delivers instead of getting mired in gridlock. Just as important, Minnesotans delivered a message about what they don't want. Minnesotans don't want to cut taxes for the rich at the expense of fully funding our public schools. Minnesotans don't want drug companies to be able to charge exorbitant prices. And Minnesotans don't think that politicians should interfere in their personal private decisions. Minnesotans have given us a tremendous privilege by electing only the second trifecta in the past 40 years in this state. And now this projected budget surplus means we can respond to Minnesotans' needs and deliver results. Far too many Minnesotans are living paycheck to paycheck. We are in the midst of a housing crisis in our state. Schools are laying off teachers and staff. Employers of all sizes are facing hiring challenges and asking for support with childcare, transportation, and workforce needs. Too many workers still have to choose between a paycheck or taking time to care for themselves or their families. Farmers and entire communities are already suffering from the impacts of climate change. The challenges we face are real, but there are real solutions too. It's not too much to ask to have the prosperity in this surplus be shared equitably. The, pr the priorities of Minnesotans have in the recent years been held up by gridlock, but now Minnesotans can affect, expect this trifecta to take big, bold action that helps them afford their lives. We know Minnesotans need this trifecta to deliver, so we plan to hit the ground running in the first week of session. Our members are ready to get started introducing bills. Committee chairs are ready to get started holding public hearings. This is an exciting time for our state. Hard work is ahead, but this trifecta is united around the core values we share with Minnesotans, and we're ready to achieve big things. Uh, and with that, we're happy to take any questions. Since we have a House member up there, the House was a little lukewarm about rebate checks. The governor made it clear he wants them quickly. Have Democrats in the legislature warmed to the idea of rebate checks? So we just had our very first caucus retreat over the weekend, and we have a, a caucus that has 20% new legislators in it in the Minnesota House. So we haven't gotten to the point in time where we're making budget decisions yet, but we certainly respect the governor's uh, proposal to us. We'll certainly take it back and consider it within caucus, but we don't have a decision to announce at this point. I might get Senator? the same answer for your for this question for yeah could you take the same question rebates how do you feel about them uh, I, I, I also respect Governor Walls's um, choices and we have 14 new members and we have not had a chance we have our retreat this weekend so we'll be discussing priorities in more detail this weekend and you know he can propose his budget and we will have a thorough conversation and probably some hearings on the issue 
All right, try again on this. Um, Elimination of the Social Security tax so it applies to wealthy recipients as well as low. But it seems like maybe we all surrendered on that in the last uh, end of the last session. Can you give me some sense? Again, I know you haven't made decisions, but will that face resistance in your caucuses, um, or do you think that issue has been uh, determined to go ahead with the total elimination? Well, we we have some members that that came up. That was a discussion point on the caucus. Um, on the campaign trail, so our caucus will have that discussion. Me personally, I'm on the record for having deep concerns about that. It's about $500 million a year. And as caucus leader, I will lead the discussion with our caucus and we will make that decision jointly. Sure, so we um, have a brand new tax chair and uh, Chair Ayesha Gomez, and so I can't uh, get ahead of our new chair. But what I will say is that uh, I think it's fair to say that there are uh, many in our caucus who do care strongly about this issue, and then there are many who have the same concerns that Senator Dietzik said about the uh, overall cost. And I'll say it's not just caucus members. The AARP was concerned about uh, eliminating Social Security around the, on the very wealthy, as Governor Walls said. So I think this will be a, a point of discussion for sure in our tax committee. Me personally, I, I share uh, Senator Dietzik's concerns. I think that if you uh, eliminate the tax on the very wealthy, uh, the very wealthiest in our state, as Governor Wall said, then that has a big impact on our budget and it has a, a more limited um, uh, impact on those individuals. Can you say anything that came out of your retreat that was a clear priority for members or, you know, at least kind of in, on a broad sense, you know, paid, paid family leave potentially, things that the surplus will make um, more possible? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't even think it needs to be out of our retreat. I think the last four years, what you've seen for the House majority is that we've been very consistent in the things that we've uh, been passing that have gone over to the Senate uh, to meet a quick death. So we're really excited now to have uh, a partner in the Senate who's going to be able to work together on many of the priorities we share with the Senate and the governor. And you mentioned paid family medical leave. That was something the governor mentioned. That will certainly be a priority. We've talked about uh, investment in K-12, fully funding education. Uh, early care and learning is uh, also a high priority for us. Investing in housing, investing in infrastructure, high priorities. Tackling climate change is a high priority. Making sure that we are protecting reproductive rights is a high priority. And I'll add uh, democracy and trying to make sure that we have uh, an excellent uh, functioning uh, democratic system in our state. So those are a few I think that we've been very clear uh, with Minnesotans on the priorities of the DFL House. And I think that everything I just mentioned uh, has broad support and bipartisan support from the public. So we'll see uh, if we can get broad and bipartisan support in the legislature. But I know that we'll be uh, working hard on those priorities with the Senate. Where are some of the places that you feel you can work with Republicans? Where's the most fertile ground for um, cooperation? You want to take this? Uh, so I, um, working with Republicans, I think that we do have a lot of areas where we can agree. I was on a panel last night with uh, Republican legislative leaders, um, and uh, Senator Duckworth mentioned that he is very interested in making sure that we're investing in affordable child care. Um, so I think that there are some areas where we're going to be able to agree, and I don't think we should assume uh, that we're not going to get bipartisan agreement on the areas that we're working together. I think bipartisan agreements are also more stable over time. So if we can, if we can get those now, as I mentioned, this is our only our second trifecta in 40 years. So uh, I don't think we should um, have any hubris that we're going to be in a perpetual trifecta. So uh, I think we're going to be working hard with the minority, but I also think that the era of gridlock is over, uh, and we have a a trifecta now that the voters have delivered. Uh, we have the ability, I think, to move big things, and we're going to be really focused on what can help Minnesotans afford their lives when we know that many are still struggling. And, and Senator, same question for you. Do you have, do you have if anywhere in particular you think there would be uh, fertile grounds for compromise with uh, the GOP and the Senate where you have a one-seat majority? I've worked closely with Senator Dreyheim on housing issues in the past. We all understand and agree that there is a crisis across the state, so how do we get people in housing, stable housing leads to better education outcomes, better health outcomes, um, and better workforce outcomes. So I think we will, you know, find agreement and figure out how we can help people get and stay in stable housing and help communities have stable housing across the state. Um, child care, like uh, Representative Long brought up, I think that is a big issue that we have found. I mean, you know, we heard on the campaign trail and the Republicans have mentioned how do we find 
um, and make sure that people can afford child care. Uh, there's been broad support on child care tax credit bills in, in the past. Um, and then thought of another issue and kind of just left me, but you know, we'll, we're going to continue to look for the look for ways we can find agreement um, because I think there are some areas where we can find agreement to help all Minnesotans. Can you expectation set for the folks who tune in for the process or for the product and tune out for the process? Are they not going to figure out where the bulk of the surplus goes until April or May, or do you see areas that you could advance? sooner where there's consensus, perhaps uh, tax conformity or maybe the rebate checks or uh, uh, construction projects paid for with cash. Are those things potentially, could they happen sooner? Um, I met with Speaker Hortman last week and so we are having those discussions on should we move some things earlier than later and trying to figure out what that process looks like. And um, we're also looking at starting at the end of session and moving this way, so kind of flow charts of where everything is and what we need to do because we do know and we heard um, on the campaign trail that there are some Minnesotans, like our economy is doing well, really well in this K-shaped K-shaped economic recovery. Some Minnesotans are doing great and some of them are struggling. And we want to make sure that those that are struggling that can't afford rent, that can't, you know, afford the food, so food shelf visits are up, can't find quality daycare. We want to, how can we help them and how can we help people fast? Madam Leader, I suppose there are many, many of the unmet needs groups that are back here. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. That are salivating because you've got a humongous number here and you've got DFLers in charge. Is there so much money available that you're not going to have to say no very often? We will be strategic and thoughtful. And as the governor said, we want to look at, you know, are there ways that we can do things better? What is the best way to do this? I think we will be thoughtful, strategic, and figure out what's the best way to help Minnesotans and have a budget. I'll just add that um, 18 billion is a big number for sure. But if you saw from the presentation, uh, the vast majority of that is one time. And so if we're thinking about the uh, ongoing uh, structural surplus, and that's six billion a year roughly, uh, but if you take inflation into account, it's about five billion a year. So we, we uh, don't have the uh, surplus that some might, it might appear from a number like 18 billion on an ongoing basis. And five billion a year when you're thinking about all the needs we face, uh, certainly uh, there will be more needs and we're able to meet with that amount of money. But I do think that uh, we will be able to do some uh, really remarkable things with this money to help Minnesotans and address some real needs. Representative Long, climate chair. I've heard the word climate change in this room more than ever, probably at least in decades of watching these forecasts. How excited does that make you as kind of one of your top issues? Boy, how much do I have to pay you for that question? Uh, <laughs> so uh, extremely excited. Um, we have, I think, maybe for the first time, I don't know, historians can look this up, uh, both a speaker and majority leader who were former energy chairs. And, but I think it's a priority for Minnesotans, and I think that's what we're reflecting. There was a Star Tribune poll that asked Minnesotans what their top issue was going into the election, and it, climate was a top five issue. This is something that Minnesotans are telling us that they care about and they want us to address. It was one of the biggest accomplishments of the trifecta uh, in Congress to take bold action on climate change, too. But they were only to get able to get to a place where they're um, going part of the way towards the commitments that President Biden has made internationally. So that really means that the states are going to be responsible for stepping up and taking a leadership role. And Governor Walls and I uh, have worked really closely on a 100% clean energy bill together, um, which I think will be a part of uh, a part of our priorities as a, a caucus moving into the session. Yeah. Anything else specific besides that 100% clean energy that we could see? Sure. Boy, I uh, would love to go deep on climate. So uh, we, uh, Governor Walls also mentioned electric vehicle uh, infrastructure investment. We uh, certainly need to have a match with the federal government for the infrastructure bill that they put out. We weren't able to get that done uh, last year on a bipartisan basis, which means we're just leaving money on the table that we're not able to invest in, in the state in things like electric vehicle infrastructure. But there's also competitive grants. And when we're Governor Walls is talking about the fifth most diverse economy. Uh, we have really great jobs in clean energy sector, but now every state in the country is going to be coming out and competing for these jobs with the federal money that's available. So if we want to actually be the leaders in the next uh, jobs in the clean energy economy, we need to keep innovating as a state. And that means investing in research. That means investing in deployment of solar energy. Uh, means making sure that we are keeping on the cutting edge of, of clean energy technology. 
Representative Long. Um, as the majority leader, uh, and you used the word trifecta numerous times in your conversations today, so I know it's an important factor. Do you believe that you actually need to have a bonding bill and have the long-term capacity for debt uh, versus doing one-time funding and actually just having a spending bill to get your priorities advanced on infrastructure and capital investment? One question. And then second, is Elon Musk's involvement in Twitter affecting uh, your caucus's use of Twitter accounts? I don't know that I haven't uh, have done a survey on the second question, but uh, on the first question, um, I'll say that I, we have tremendous needs. We weren't able to get a bonding bill done over the last two years. And so uh, we, I heard um, uh, Representative Torkelson say on Almanac that 1.5 billion was the, the number that uh, he had in mind. And so, uh, you know, I'm hoping that we're able to do uh, some large bonding bills. Uh, I don't think we're at a point yet where we're, we're ready to make a decision on, on whether we're going alone or together, but I think that we have real needs and we have to do those, uh, do that work together this year. Your position on that as well. I know Senator Pappas, the binding chair, has had numerous conversations with Representative Fu Lee in the House, the binding chair, and I know they have, uh, they're have they working on um, different options of what to do. I think it, I think we will be looking to pass a bonding bill, and then if that doesn't happen, we'll have those alternative discussions. But um, I know I have talked to Senator Pappas, and both of us um, are sickened, upset that, again, they walked away from an, agree an agreement at the end of the year and we didn't pass a bonding bill because you look at it, all those projects that could have been moving forward since last May um, that are still sitting out there and the costs are only going up. And so we want to pass a bonding bill to help the state. Last question. Uh, qu quick question. So you have a ma uh, majority in both chambers and a giant surplus. Will this be the year that you can get a budget done on time and do it in a way that's transparent so the public can participate um, and not have the last minute sort of back and forth behind closed doors? I mean, is this a year when we can um, expect uh, more transparency and, and on-time budgeting for the state? Our goal is to get done on time and our goal is to be transparent and have those hearings so that Minnesotans can participate um, throughout the whole session, that we will have hearings on a variety of topics. I guess the, the only thing I'll add is that um, I think that uh, divided government has forced an end of session, all you know, everything in high stakes negotiation, and I don't think we're going to need to be in that circumstance. I think that you're going to see uh, things moving earlier. You're going to see uh, things moving uh, individually. And so I think this will be a session with a high level of transparency for the public and where we can be proud of the work we're doing together. Well, thank you all very much. Appreciate your time. Can I get one more? We haven't heard from Whip Hollins. Could I? Bring her up. Uh, in light of the record amount of diversity coming into both the House and the Senate and your membership, what could we see in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, legislation, getting at some of the, the gaps, achievement gap, ownership gap, you name it? Could you briefly, briefly address that? Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, well, I think that we've really talked a lot about the things that were left on the table last year that addressed a ton of the, inf um, of the equity questions that are at play. We know that we have deep, deep disparities in almost every area that we're looking at, right? From housing, education, I mean, everything that you can think of, we absolutely need to invest in equity. And so that's gonna be one of our top priorities, and we're really thinking about it in a more holistic way. So not specific bills that address equity necessarily, but making sure that's a part of our entire thought process and our work process as we go forward. And so part of that is working with our diverse members making sure that they are represented across the entire spectrum of the work that we're doing within committees and um, in conference committees, presumably, so that we can get the best possible outcomes for all Minnesotans. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am House Minority Leader Lisa Damoth, and it is good to be with you today. I think what we have heard earlier this afternoon is there are ways that we can work together. There are some provisions that were encouraging for me to hear, but I do have to be honest with you. Hearing a $17.6 billion surplus was a little jaw-dropping. Dropping. That was shocking to hear. We know that Minnesotans are being overtaxed, money that could be kept within Minnesotan families to help with high grocery prices and with high energy bills, that money needs to go back to Minnesotans. 
I look forward to the next session, balancing out our revenues so we aren't taking so much from the families. But I can tell you, I believe, my caucus believes that tax hikes should be completely off the table. Republicans are gonna push for meaningful tax cuts. We think there is an opportunity, as I've said, to work with the DFL on things like social security. Those are things that both parties campaigned on and we look forward to that work being done. We want to explore tax reductions for middle income families that we also had agreed on that were agreed to last session. One other area of caution is that so much of the surplus is one time spending. It's one time money. So we need to look at possible one time rebates to our tax filers. This is Minnesotans money and it is not a reason for the government to create um, new or governmental spending. Those are the comments that I have, and I'm happy to take a couple of questions. Madam Leader, what did you learn from the campaign trail that uh, might inform the Republican House agenda this time? Thank you for the question. Uh, what we heard is that prices are high for Minnesotans. They are looking for tax cuts. They are also concerned about public safety. We need to be safe in our communities, and our kids need to achieve in their educations. You mentioned uh, tax rebates. Does that suggest possible openness to the Walls checks idea if he's going to be bringing that back this session? I would possibly consider one-time rebates to our filers. Um, it's a discussion that we would have as a caucus. What about a, a bonding bill? Do you have a sense of what kind of size your caucus might be open to? Are there priorities or spending proposals that you might not be interested in in a bonding bill? I think Governor Walls mentioned money for Minneapolis and Lake Street. Um, in the bonding bill, we've always supported that core infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, wastewater infrastructure. Those are things that we would consider. What about some of the issues mentioned earlier that could be working together? Housing, child care, do you see some legislation there that would definitely get your caucus support? We know that we need uh, affordable housing across the state in greater Minnesota and in the metro areas too. Um, that issue of child care or the lack thereof hits all parts of our state looking at attracting more people to stay in the area of childcare, making it affordable and accessible for our families also helps our workforce. And what about workforce attraction? I've been asking them all about the fact with our very low unemployment and the fact we need to attract people. How do you think we attract and retain people in our workforce in our state? I think we have amazing businesses, both large and small in Minnesota. It's places that we want people to work. So making sure that they have childcare as needed, that our employees can find housing um, and transportation in wherever they are choosing to live and work will make that attractive. Can I ask a question over here? Anybody else? Do oh, you want to go, John? Go yeah, ahead. Quick one. Um, would you favor tying any of these uh, like local government aid increases to like some type of a mechanism that says the money has to be used to deliver property tax relief, that they can't just be absorbed by the local budgets? I think we need to have all of those discussions as we're working through into the session, both at the caucus level and then in committee. And I guess my question was similar uh, as far as um, delivering some money to uh, local governments regarding public safety. We need to attract people into the area of public safety. We need to increase law enforcement, make sure that that is an area that people want to, um, to work in and to keep our community safe. So as, are you, I don't want to complete your sentence, but are you saying that you guys would be supportive of Similar things that you were talking about last session, meaning helping locals recruit, maybe bonuses, retention bonuses, training support, things like that. Those are all areas that we would consider, yes. How much are you expecting the DFL trifecta, as they've been talking about it, to ask for your help or to, to be partner, to want to partner with you versus them kind of running over your caucus wishes. I mean, are you bracing for tension in in the legislature this year? That's an interesting question. Bracing for tension in the legislature. I think that always can happen. Um, I know that all of our members are looking forward to getting to work, to building relationships 
both with each other. We have 25 new members in our caucus, building relationships with each other, and then also across the aisle with our DFL counterparts. Um, that's work that we can do together, and I think there's so many times that we agree more than we disagree. That's where our focus is going to be. Where we can work together, we will. If there's provisions that are concerning that we don't agree with, we will definitely make those loud too. Do you have any reaction um, on the Social Security tax issue? Um, you, you had mentioned Democrats campaign on that, but it sounds like there is some resistance, perhaps substantial resistance from DFL leaders. Um, just do you have any reaction to that uh, today? I believe that um, ending that tax on Social Security across the board is what we need to do. That's what we talked about on the campaign trail, and I think that it is an area that we do need to focus on. Thank you.